Welcome to the Confidence Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Bailey, and today we have the amazing Matt Schaup joining us. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. I hope you are too. Very excited. Yeah, thanks for having me. We had a great conversation leading up to this, and we've got a lot to talk about it, sounds like. Yeah, we do. And I know this is going to be a great conversation that everyone's going to love. You've got an incredible story to share, which I know people are going to be very interested in. We, like we talk a lot about overcoming adversity, increasing your confidence, building your mindset, and what it's like to be an entrepreneur, and often coming from nothing to being a success and how you're then able to help other people. And that's why I was really interested to speak with you. And also, what we'll speak about a little later is um, our conjoined, is that a word? <laughs> um, interest in Spain yeah. as well. So, yes, yeah. And I know that's going to be a great conversation too. So could you just give the listeners um, an introduction to yourself, who you are, what you do, and why yeah. you do it? Yeah. So so I live here in uh, northern northern Colorado, and uh, I'm a husband, father, serial entrepreneur. I love business. That's just my, my space where uh, I'm in love and I thrive. I love people. I love investing in people. And, uh, you know, a couple of side hobbies I have. Uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu has been a huge part of my life for 16 years. So we have an academy. We instruct. I, I teach little kids. And uh, yeah, I love Spain and everything about Spain. I love taking groups to Spain and drinking the coffee and cooking paella. And, um, you know, I really, I, I wake up every day. I tell people I, I pinch myself because I, I get to hang out, have coffee with really amazing people and just help share parts of my story and what I've learned from it to help make their their life, their business and their leadership better. And um, and I'm a big believer in, I, I love to do crazy stuff, once in a lifetime stuff that people say can't be done. Mm -hmm. and um, build a business around it. So I've really been able to build a, a business and life of my dreams. Doesn't mean it doesn't come with struggles and challenge, but that's what I get to do every day over here. And then I take, you know, two to four week breaks over in Spain once or twice a year. Amazing. Where did your love of Spain come from? So I started studying Spanish uh, early middle school into high school, and I decided I'll minor in it at university and college. And I had this one professor every day in a Spanish culture class, she's just pushing, hey, you've got, you've got to go to my country. You have to come visit. You should study abroad. And I had never thought about it. And one day I just said, let's do it. I literally put everything aside, stepped out of my comfort zone, everything that I knew, packed up, got a visa, got a passport, and then rolled over to Spain and lived with a family right outside Madrid for five months. And, um, you know, you know, Spain, right? So we do school Monday through Thursday. So we had three-day weekends that mostly became four-day weekends because every other Monday, it's a Saints Day, right? So they it's a point day. So they closed something down. Mm -hmm. And we traveled all over and um, became fluent in the language and just fell in love with, with everything about it. I love that. It's such a different way of life in Spain, isn't it? It, it very much is. Um, I tell people that, that I'm a different Matt. I'm Mateo when I, when I get there. It's just things are slower. And I, I really flipped this switch. It takes me a few days to get back to the language real fluently, but things are just slow. You you can enjoy things. Now I'm obviously not there working, mm -hmm. uh, which makes a difference, but just a different different lifestyle. You know, you can sit and have, you know this, right? You have a three hour meal with some friends and lose track of time. And you're like, ah, oh, we'll just stay here a few more hours. It'll be dinner time. <laughs> and- um, Those are the best days. <laughs> they are, they are. And the sun tends to always shine. It does. Yeah. I've rarely, rarely been there when, when the weather wasn't nice. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously, obviously, quite obviously in Mallorca and the, <laughs> the coldest it, I've ever felt it here was one February and I had, I did have a scarf on and my flying jacket <laughs> and I could see my breath and that happened once in the past 12 years. Yeah. Once, once a decade. Yeah. That, that's about, that's about right. Yeah. It's beautiful, beautiful weather where, where you are. Yeah, so I've been back from my last trip from London. I've been back for two weeks and I've got such a tan. I, I'm so happy. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, tell us about your your business and what you do to help people with now, because I'd like to then explore how you grew your first business after um, yeah. being laid off. Yeah, I, I would love to. So so the big business that I'm focusing on right now, it's it's mattshop.com. And what I've found over two decades of spending time with entrepreneurs is it is a it is a there's this dichotomy, right? It's 
I quit, I quit working for the man. I'm going to go do my own thing. And it's exciting. It's exhilarating. It's the part of the roller coaster where you're, you're just coming over right? and, you're, and you're just, you're so excited. And then boom, you get hit with the reality, which is the flip side of the coin of, yeah, you just created this, this vehicle for freedom and you can do what you want, create these ideas, but then it's hard. There's cash flow issues. There's, there's people resources issues. And it's this constant back and forth like really opposite side of the coin where it's highs of highs lows of lows and unless you're an entrepreneur you don't get it mm -hmm. right um you know I, I feel like a lot of people are in jobs that they hate and they're just miserable all the time but at least for them they can consistently be miserable you just don't know what you're going to get as an entrepreneur so I, I feel like I've experienced that your your mindset is so important who you surround yourself with is so important you need to invest in yourself but, but the issue is that, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs don't have the time or the resources. So what I do with my business is I take a business owner anywhere from a set of free tools that are totally free. They can access them all the way up to $20 books. I do speaking engagements and group masterminds all the way to taking groups to Spain on leadership adventure retreats. But you, they need to be plugged into community because there's, it's very lonely. You know this, right? We are talking about this. It's, mm -hmm. It's lonely in this world and we can be very isolated and a lot of times feel like we're a slave and we're trapped by this monster that we created to produce freedom. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it just it can mess with you. It can mess with your confidence. It can mess with, with your health. Um, yeah. So I just get to wake up and help people make their life, business and leadership better with my story and experiences. Yeah. I love that so much. And you're so right about community. That's a massive part of what we do and uh, we talk about this a lot and the message better together because people need people yeah. there are far too many people that are lonely in the UK and they don't you know, don't know how to do something about it or to change it so yeah. you know when you are an entrepreneur and you, you, you're setting out in a new business it is really important to you know be a part of a good community of masterminds people who pick you up and lift you up and inspire you and um, well, what's the best thing for you about delivering masterminds and retreats? Because like, I do the same. Yeah. So the so the Spain retreat. So my first time throwing a retreat. I told you I like to do crazy things. That yeah. People are saying you're going to do what? You're going to take this is 2022. So there's still COVID restrictions. You mm -hmm. right in Spain a, a year ago, somebody was saying you're going to take ten people over that have never been to Spain and do this multi city, you know, amazing race style leadership retreat adventures experiences. I go, yeah, we're going to do it. And um, there's a lot of planning that goes into it. So for, for me, <clears throat> I want to give somebody an experience that they're going to remember for the rest of their life. Yeah. And I want to use that experience to facilitate things in them that push them out of their comfort zone. Like we didn't talk a lot about business on the business leadership retreat, but they learned so many things about business by being put into a scenario where they're real, like they're really uncomfortable. I put them in some very interesting uh -huh. situations. Nobody's going to die. You're going to be really uncomfortable though. So that's, that's how I like to do it. And I, and I think it went very well. We debriefed and there's some things we're going to do different or, or not do at all and then change. So it's, it's a new experience for me, but I think what, what people really appreciated is just the love and passion I have to share the culture with people that was more present than maybe a logistical mistake that I made because it it wasn't perfect. We Logistics like the transportation. We, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, you know, these, these <laughs> things are it's just a part yeah. of the what can happen. Well, ultimately, if people have had a good yeah. experience and they've learned mm -hmm. something and they've then yeah. been able to take that back and go and implement it into their business or, and or their life, then you've done a good job. Yeah, we it, it really it really was because the <clears throat> the feedback we received from people while we were there and then after we were back was was really touching. And one of the things that I remember the most is, you know, you you do this, right? So you're planning this retreat. You go, here's the itinerary and we're type A, like we're taking control of everything. And you go, this thing right here, this is gonna be, this is gonna be the magic of the yeah. retreat. So I had this third experience we were gonna do in Spain. I said, here's gonna be the magic. And we weren't able to do it because of weather and logistics. And I'm sitting here like, what are we going to do instead? So we really quickly called an audible and did a, a very different experience. Yeah. And it was the best thing there that right. literally just, you pull it out of the back pocket. And uh, I know you've probably been there throwing your, you know, your <laughs> events. So you have to be flexible. 
And you need to let the energy and the vibe and the response of the people in the events help dictate where you're going to take it. You can't be so rigid. Um, You know, I'm a control freak. I know a lot of people that that throw events, but you you have to be in control of your event. Um, You do, but But you're right. You do have to be flexible because sometimes things happen. And Mm -hmm. I think some of some of it is giving people a break. I, I don't give people my entire itinerary. And I just say, you know, oh, it's this is happening and things may be subject to change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's got to be some surprises. That was very important for me. They, you know, there was a couple, a couple of people like, well, hold on. You haven't told me much. We're going to land in Madrid on Monday and then go home on the following Sunday. What are we doing? I said, don't worry about it. And they have to trust you, though. So yeah. when you're doing these kind of things, there has to be a level of that the people obviously know you and like you, but have a deep trust. Yeah. To do things like this. Yeah. Definitely. That's what I'm excited about for my for well for our next one, our third one. It's in four weeks. Um and I, I've got stuff planned that I've not done on other ones. So I'm yeah. I'm just like I'm chomping at the bit to get there. And yeah. they are, they're so excited. And it's a nice feeling, isn't it? Knowing that you've got these people that are putting their trust into you and going, right, I'm all in. I'm gonna come. I'm gonna. I'm gonna play full out, and that's when you get the best results from people. Yeah, you've got to create an environment too, where you where you pull them out of obviously their comfort zone, but where you place them in an environment where they don't have any other option than like they have to participate. They they can't they can't back out. You know. Yeah. So yeah, oh, it's yeah. been fun, and and the Camino trip that we're doing in September that I've hiked the, this part of the Camino twice, but but never in this kind of setting yeah. so this will be the first time we're launching this but i, I know it's going to go amazing I mean, the people we already have that are booked for it they're yeah. amazing people they just they they believe in me as people that i know very well so that'll yeah. be that'll be fun yeah I'm, ex- I'm excited to hear about that when when that happens what happened in your life and your career to get you to where you are today to be able to offer these amazing things to people so so i sit here today and share that on on paper based on where i came from how i grew up and and who i ran around with i should be dead in prison or or disappeared so i grew up in new jersey till i was 10 and i literally look down the list i pull out the school photo of me and the kids on the playground dead disappeared went to jail whatever and i remember being told that a lot as a kid i was very brilliant very smart and i got told to sit down shut up follow the rules yeah. Uh, but I also got se- severely bullied. I was a very easy target, big buck teeth and go- just goofy looking, you know, easy to pick on. Um, and that that really wrecked my confidence. And, and I was just always searching for something that would give me certainty and purpose and, yeah. and confidence. So we moved to New Jersey or to Colorado from New Jersey, asked my parents for $200. They said, nope, uh, go find a way to make money. If you want to buy a CD player, boombox. And I took the lawnmower and I went and cut grass. And at that moment, business for me was that was my thing i tell people that's that's my jam you know you might you might bully me and kick my ass on the playground Um, i'm not the smart kid i'm not the sports kid but i'll I'll outwork you i'll out earn you i'll out magazine sale you at the at the school you know magazine so that was just my thing marketing sales and um i probably produced i did uh, and started an unhealthy relationship with money Mm-hmm. And feeling like, hey, the more money you have, the more valuable you are as a as a person, right? So that's just what I put a lot of faith, confidence, and stock in. And then 10 years after that, I find myself very broke, very in debt, fired from a corporate job that I hate. I was fired very unkindly. And mm-hmm. I'm standing in a parking lot with everything in a box. And I decided, hey, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. And that was when I launched my first you know, official company. Yeah. What did that feel like then to to have, to, did it feel like, like it was the end of the world, the bottom? So, so I'm, you know, leading up to getting fired, I had been almost a year in the mortgage banking industry and I'm coming home every day in a shirt and a tie, like not, that's not me. I'm telling Emily, my wife, I'm, I'm not digging this. I'm going to leave, but it's going to be on my own terms because I'm a control freak, right? I'm going to do it my way. And they bring in a new bank president one day and he calls me in and I thought he wanted to meet me. And he, I literally walk in his office and he said, put all your shit in a box. You're fired. Get out. And I stand there. And then his next follow up, because I painted in college, I learned about the business while I was in college for four years. He's like, maybe you should go back and do that painting thing. And he cinches up his you know, little banker's tie. And I'm like, what a dick. Like, you're a dick. 
and, and I, I literally, I went back, I got all my stuff. I threw it in the box. I gave him the middle finger. I walked out the door and I'm standing with all my stuff in a box. So I was, I was angry because of my childhood and the bullying. So I think my default emotion it, it is and was anger for a long time. We'll talk more about that. So I'm pissed, but then I'm also relieved at the same time. And I'm like, I get to go do whatever I want. But what I remember is I had to have an answer for Emily when I got home, whatever it is. I'm going to come home and cry about it. I'm going to go start a bit, whatever. Like I need to have an answer. So I had a 10 minute drive home and decided on the way home. I called a few painters that I knew from college and said, let's do this. Nice. And that's where it was born. <laughs> that's where it was born. Yeah. And I came home and Emily goes, you're home early for lunch. I said, yeah, they gave me a permanent lunch. And uh, <laughs> all, all, all I knew how to do literally, like when I'm, I'm 10 years old, I know how to cut grass. So I cut yeah. grass. I'm 20 years old. I know how to paint houses. Go, go paint houses. So I walked around a couple of neighborhoods and knocked on doors for the rest of the, the summer and the year. And we did top line half million dollars in revenue and very profitable. And then we started digging ourselves out of the debt that I had created uh, before Emily and I got married. And then the journey just went from there. Things started growing and that turned and launched into other businesses and opportunities. Mm. What did it feel like, like going from starting a business from scratch is difficult were there any moments mm -hmm. where you thought god I, I can't do this i don't want to do this this is too hard so the group the group i worked with i remember everybody there was super supportive um as long as you didn't go compete against them mm -hmm. and there was one guy in particular who's like you can't do this without us you know so like growing up there was always these people you're teachers, you're going to end up in prison, you're going to be a troublemaker, this, this, you can't run a painting business. So there was always that song playing in the back of my mind, if I gave too much attention to those people that the truth is, though, I had four years of previous experience, like I had practice, I, I had sold a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of paint jobs over the four years in college. So yeah. technically, in terms of did I ever think I couldn't knock on a door, land a job, create business? No, I knew I had that down. But where I stunk was managing people. I, I had no self-awareness, no leadership skills. Everything I did was very angry and aggressive. So I was a prick to work for. Nobody wanted to hang around and, and keep working for me. And it, it took about five, six years for somebody to really check me and say, hey, you're the problem here with your business. But I think there was always that self-doubt that I carried from my childhood of, you know, can I do this like in a, in a big way? What helps you to overcome that then and build that confidence back up? It's it's where it's where you spend your attention and confidence is a weird thing. Um, I worked with a neuro linguistic programming coach for a long time, and he basically breaks it down very simply into you have an experience of high emotional intensity, intensity, right? It's it's level ten positive, level ten negative, and you create this story and this vow and this conclusion about life, and then that becomes your filter, the the way that you see everything everything through so what what i had to realize is like what is the program that you're running and i always feel like and i'm sure entrepreneurs do you have these two little voices on your shoulder like the good the good guy you've got this you go get it i believe in you and then yeah but this client didn't go with you oh you're you're awful you're gonna fail so it's just where do you mm -hmm. where do you give that attention so i'd say the three like tactical things if somebody's taking notes is where do you spend that attention you're going to be your own worst critic you know, you see all this, oh, tell, turn down the haters. Yeah, I can give somebody else the middle finger, like if they're hating on me, a million times easier than I can tell myself to stop with that that negative voice. Yeah. So where, where do you pay the attention to the internal and external voices? And then who do you surround yourself with? I was lucky and fortunate enough to very intentionally go out and find mentors and people that I aspired to be like. One was a, a carpet cleaner. He moved here from Lebanon in the 80s, started from nothing. And he's like, I can't believe how successful you are. Let's have coffee. And he'd buy me coffee and just shoot the shit, you know? So those were those were two big things. And then the third thing, which might be a fourth thing, is things are going to take longer than you think. Yeah. And be okay with that. You might take three steps back, but those might be three steps that needed to be taken back because you were about to walk into trouble. And, and don't worry about that. And then maybe a fifth thing, I know I'm going on, uh, is, is don't compare yourself and your journey to other people. Like oh, your journey God, is your yes. journey. <laughs> knock, knock that off knock that off like you know what like like it's it's one thing be careful you hear this inspiring story 
right? Jeff Bezos started Amazon. But then you're like, but I don't have Jeff Bezos' yacht, so I'm doing something wrong. That's Jeff Bezos' deal. You know, let, let, him, let him be him. Let that story inspire you, but don't use it as a measuring stick. And, and I see a lot of people get those confused and they get mixed and they get inspired and then and then they kill their dreams like in the same sentence. Yeah, it's the, that level of jealousy versus like being envious and then using that to fuel yeah. you in, in the right way. I, I used to be a very, like, I used to get quite jealous. I'm like, why does all the, like, why do they get all the luck? And then mm -hmm. when you, through time and experience with a bit of age, you, you start to understand that actually, like, there's a lot of work that goes into these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, just, you don't buy a lot of lottery ticket and win. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a really fun story to share is I was having breakfast with a, a billionaire. He's a billionaire. He owns a very successful company. He went broke many times getting this company going. And we're just sitting there having breakfast. He's a he's a normal guy, regular guy. And we're talking about our issues. And they were both personnel issues where somebody left the company and made some really false claims. And it was just, it was ugly, right? We both had ugly situations going on. His just had seven more zeros or whatever after it, you know, in terms of the measuring stick. And we're sitting there and he's like, man, it's the, it's the same problems. He goes, this is a billionaire, right? Everybody wants to be like this guy. Yeah. He goes, man, sometimes I just wish I ran a $1.5 million business made three, 400 grand a year. And I'm good. I mean, like he wants to be what yeah. everybody, and, yeah. and it was really eye opening. And we're just people with the same struggles and fears and, and challenges. And we, we can go home to a lot of the same things. And I think we forget about that, especially when we start comparing is, is don't, don't ask for, don't ask for what you think you want too much because you might get it and realize that you don't want it. Yeah. And a lot of people like they focus on what they don't want rather than what they do. And then that's what they get because that's mm -hmm. what they're focused on. The things that they don't want. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, when I did the, you know, a lot of this coaching, I, I love the NLP, right? And there's towards and, and away programming. It's like you make a million dollars, you can either be less poor or closer to wealth. And it's the same million dollars, but two totally different stories that you're playing and realities that you're living and just conversations that you're having with yourself. So yeah. that that's it. That's a huge thing. So I think, you know, just the, the original question, right, is building confidence is get, become your own psychologist. And really, like, really understand what's going on in here, and then pay for therapy. Like, for real, I, I'm a guy. I'll say it. Most men don't want to admit it. I've, I've gotten a lot of therapy, and it's great. Yeah. Go do that. I was speaking to a friend the other day, actually, and was sort of saying about therapy, and I was like, everybody probably needs therapy, or you know, even if it's a one or two or three sessions, or at certain periods of your life. Sometimes you just need to offload to somebody that's going to help you to to understand it in a way that some other people can't. Yeah. And, and they help us get out of our own way because, you know, you're sitting with somebody, coach, therapist, and you're telling them a story and first person, I did this, I had that. And they're just looking at it from a, from a different angle. So somebody that can help you get out of your own way, get out of your own story and almost remove yourself from yourself and look at it from, from a different angle, get perspective. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's like that um, bird's eye view, isn't it? As if you're... Yeah. You're looking at yourself, having taken yourself out of yourself. That, yeah. that can do some powerful things when you go mm -hmm. deep and go do things like that. It's um, it's a challenging kind of thing to do. So you've obviously been through some challenges yourself. And, mm -hmm. and I always believe that we go through challenges and we have things that are really difficult to help make us better people. And even though like, we don't realize it at the time because it's all shit, I'm like, oh, fucking hell, like, why is this happening? Yep, yep, uh-huh, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. What's been something that's happened to you that you didn't realize at the time but has actually taught you a lot, like a, a, a big challenge? Yeah, yeah, so it, it's really interesting because I'm, so I'm I'm 41, and when, when I was 19, I found God in the back of a police car in handcuffs after being pretty, pretty severely addicted to drugs and alcohol. So leading up and, and I didn't realize the power of that story and that realization and what it has taught me about how you just love on somebody where they're at, mm -hmm. right. No matter where they're at. And, and it, it, like, I just started sharing the story six, six months ago because it all finally came full circle, but you know, growing up, 
money with money and business was the thing. And then the people I surrounded myself with we talked about that. They were all making, making money and going drinking and drugging. So that's what I did. And then that gives you more confidence, right? Confidence. And um, I'm doing this every weekend, every weekend. I should have been dead. OD. Like we, we both said, good thing. We didn't go to a visa, right? <laughs> yeah. I never, I, I never, <laughs> never made it there, but, the, but there's nights, you know, like did make it home on the ferry. Should, you know, like, how did I get here? And it's a New Year's Eve back from uh, yeah, 2000 to 2001. And I'm completely wasted trying to walk home. It's Colorado cold. And I got lost in a neighborhood trying to climb a fence and a car pulls up behind me and the guy grabs me, spins me around and slams me up against the car. It's an off-duty police officer, but he handcuffs me, puts me in a police car. And up to that point in my life, I had had very negative experiences with, with people that were Jesus followers or people of any kind of faith. They were judgy. They were driving me away from wanting to have anything to do with that. Yeah. And this police officer says, Hey, he goes, how drunk are you? This is what he says. How drunk are you? Well, I'm pretty drunk, but can you tell me where you live? Yeah. I can tell you how to get there. Well, then you're not that drunk. You're not going to die. I'm really busy. At, at first he was a little assertive and aggressive. He's like, I'm just going to take you home. If you can tell me how to get there. Um, but then he says to me, he goes, hey, what's your story? Why are you why are you out here drunk at two in the morning, falling down in a field? And um, I don't remember what I said to him, but I remember he's asking me. And he, he takes me home. He gets me out of the car. He had the control, power, and authority to punish me, to take me to jail. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in the drunk tank, but I haven't. I, I don't ever want to go there. And he told me that. He's like, I can take you here. But he goes, I, I think, you know, there's some people in your life that love you. I think you should consider the decisions that you're making. And I just want you to know that, that, you know, I, I love you and I just want you to get home safe and I'm letting you off the hook on this one. And I don't know why, but I woke up the next day. I'm like, man, I've had these negative experiences with people that claim to be godly. And then just this mm -hmm. police officer that could have punished me just, just totally takes care of me and met me where I was at. So that just led me on this, this journey to, to find God and give my life to God. And it, it literally took, me two decades to realize the power of the impact that that person had in my life. So, you know, when you're in this business space, you're doing a mastermind, we're on a podcast, who knows who's listening to this, mm -hmm. like wherever you're at, find somebody that, that is pouring into you that loves you and, and let that be the guiding light. Even if it's really dark, that there's always going to be those good people. And then when you have the opportunity to meet somebody that's down in the, the gutter or the dumps, you need to be that for them whether you believe in God or not, or whatever God you believe in, just as a, as a human, um, that's, that's just a, a motto that I live by, but that was, a, that was a challenge. And I just didn't realize the the impact of it for, for a while. Yeah. That's yeah. really like, uh, it's a really powerful thing to go through that and come out the other side and go, Oh, hold on a minute. Like I needed that person at that time. And he mm -hmm. came because the, the the universe gives. Like you didn't know yeah. before no. he arrived that that was what you needed. And it's often a stranger or somebody that you don't know for you yeah. to to hear that wake up call to go. Okay, that this is like the path I'm on is not the path I'm meant to be on. Yeah, and it helps me now as I as I interact with the world because you know I can I can be short tempered and get frustrated over over little things and I'm I'm easy to just pop off sometimes you know my wife always lets me know when when I do but it's just allowed me to slow down like hey this person might be having a bad day or be giving bad service because they're really going through something right now and what I say right now the look I give or maybe the smile I don't give them um, could could really change the direction of, of their life. So I think back to my life and just the people that have had impact in it that have been turning points. I know who they are and when they were in my life, I want to be that for other people. And I may never know if I was or how, how it impacted them, but I think that's just one of the beautiful things about life. And it's bigger than business. It's bigger than profit and P and L's and all of that stuff that great to talk about, right? Tactically, but like there's a bigger responsibility as a business owner for people. Definitely. And that's why I like podcasts and interviews and like doing stuff like this, because yeah. you said we don't know who's listening to this. I mean, we don't all know some of them, but somebody will be listening to this. They will never know. And they'll go, oh, fuck that. And that's why it is important to share stories and challenges and what you've overcome and and let people know that it's OK if things are going badly and that you can turn things yeah. around 
and it it gives them permission to go and change things for themselves. And that's why I love having conversations like this and doing this because, like, I don't, it's it, the the podcast is free. It's out there for for everybody to listen to, and it does. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of all of the stuff that goes into it, but I love doing it, and purely for the fact of. Well, there's two reasons. I like having interesting conversations. And two, I know that it's going to help somebody somewhere. And from whatever perspective, I'm also finding that a lot of people that I'm speaking to more recently have kind of similar stories to what you just shared. Um, I have a similar story. And it's very interesting being in that entrepreneurial space with these kinds of people and we get it. A lot of people in in a day-to-day in your nine to five, if you tell tell them that kind of story and they're they're comfortable, they're doing, you know, they're doing okay. Yeah. They don't understand what it takes to go from from there, from down there to to up to where we are to being able to have the confidence to share that story. Because it's it's stories like that and they're not easy to tell. Well, and, it, and it's not, and I, and I, we can, we can talk a little bit more, but I wrote my, my book painted baby and it's all about how you connect with clients and, and anybody in your business through being brave and vulnerable in your storytelling. And there's such a, we live in a culture, right? We were talking about this, the, the bodybuilding shows, right? Yeah. Like I did one. You, you, did you do one? Do we, are you, you're in that, you're in that world, right? I'm in the world. Um, I did a photo yeah. shoot and I've got another one coming up. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like best, best we ever look, worst we ever felt. We're miserable. You you get this this one moment with the lighting and the photo, and you look awesome. Um, and that's what gets pushed out there on the social, yeah. on the Instagram. So there's this we paint this picture of perfection, and it's unsustainable, un- unattainable, right? And, and then other people feel like they have to posture that way in business. So I'm trying to sell a job a decade ago, right? Oh, we're five star, A plus, and customer calls bullshit on me and he goes tell me about a time you screwed up and I go wait you're not supposed to do that you don't share your imperfections your vulnerabilities and and I did I shared a story about when we had a paint sprayer explode we almost killed a baby we painted a baby our our painting company did yeah and he wanted to know about it and how I handled it and then he says hey you're the kind of guy I want to do business with and I I left that engagement saying hold on a minute I, I just did the opposite of what I thought sales 101 is and and I signed the biggest contract of my life and then I just went on this journey of saying hey you know maybe if we just show up who we are authentically right just just who we are all the imperfections we're not airbrushed and and we show that to people it's it's, they breathe a sigh of relief because they're like wait I'm the same human I have the same shit going on let's let's have a real conversation and put all the put all this aside and then that's where you connect and that's where trust is built I mean, think about those people. You you know who those five people are in your life. They know your stuff. I know who mine are. And that's who you're going to go to when shit gets real. Um, and, and they don't want to have the, hey, how was your weekend? Oh, I'm fine. No, you're not. Like, let's talk. And, yeah. and that's that's how you really build a bit. That's how you really build a business, how you really impact people. And I think the world's going that way. So when you say that, that you're you're experiencing this, what, the, the vulnerable entrepreneur, they're going to come out on top. But, but everybody's scared because it's not, it's very anti-cultural and very not the norm it's not yeah no it's not the norm but it's becoming the norm in our circles in in our world it's just about helping us to normalize it because everybody has shit in their life everybody has been through some sort of trauma whatever like if yours is worse or better than somebody else's it it's it's not um it's not a competition your problems are relevant to you yes yep it, you know, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't matter if one's perceived to be worse or the other, but what sharing a story does is helps to normalise you as a person or, and, like, you know, make you relatable, but it, it helps other people to understand that they're not alone and that they can do things too. Yeah, yeah. yep. I'm, I'm very interested in, in hearing more about your book it's been a fun journey. It took me, so I wrote, I wrote my first book in 2011 and I didn't know how to write a book. Uh, I didn't identify as an author. It was a bucket list thing. It was very quick. It, it's a great book. Like it's a good, it's a good book, but I didn't understand the world of, of writing really well. 
So when I when I set out to do Painted Baby, I actually started this in 2015. And the, the honest truth is that I let too many people's opinions and negative opinions, and I was scared and I didn't want to put myself out there. Now, I'm glad that the, the silver lining is it's a way better book now, eight years later than it would have been then. But but the truth is, is that I, I chickened out for a long time and I finally committed. Um, I was actually in Spain about a year ago. And my good friend, Mike Michalowicz, I don't know if you have heard of him, business author, he wrote a book and he featured the painted baby story in his book. So it comes out and I'm on the beach in Spain listening to this. And I'm like, damn, I go, what a great story. And then he starts messaging me a couple of weeks later. He's like, so many people love this story and they're reaching out to me about it. And he's like, you got to finish your book because he's been a great mentor and coach of mine in the, in the authorship space. And he basically was like, quit, quit being a chicken shit is, is what he said in so many words. And that was when I committed. I said, you know, my story needs to be told by me. And, and I hooked up with a, with a great publisher and put myself in a position where I couldn't back out. You know, I made some, some really big commitments and promises and a year later it's, it's out. And it's been really cool because I'm, I'm sitting here now that get getting the, the messages from people that have read it, seeing the reviews and how it's impacting their life and business. I'm, you know, kicking myself for not doing it sooner, but I've, <laughs> I've, I've really enjoyed the, enjoyed the journey. You know, it's basically that like, Hey, you've got a story to share that you think is the skeleton in your closet that you don't want anybody to know that dirty little secret, but it's your best relationship building tool that you have. And nobody has anything like it because it's your story. Yeah, definitely. There's been a few things in my story that I've held back on over the years through not through lack of confidence of telling it, but partly through not wanting it to impact people that I work with. And like, because I work with my mom, mm -hmm. she's my business partner. So mm -hmm. having like thought, thought about it, thinking about it, speaking to the right people about it, decided that actually that was, and that is my story. And that the things that I've been through yeah. like make me who I am. And because of that, I've been featured in the press. I was on live TV a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, um, awesome. <laughs> so nervous before. And then I loved it. So I'm like, right, give me more. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. But share, sharing that story. So having the confidence to go, I fucked up. But then this is how I repaired it. And I think that's the thing that people are missing when it comes to sharing the things that are going on like just t tell us what happened but tell us how you overcame it because adversity makes us stronger when we build that resilience and you build that confidence yeah. and as you said mm -hmm. like earlier like your mindset it, it matters and then, and then those people you know it's like you see i walk into these companies and they've got the mission statement vision statement big plaque on their wall oh we stand for family integrity whatever whatever the words are it's like, well, when does that get tested? That gets tested when you paint a baby or you screw up really bad. And that's where your integrity really comes through. So, you know, who are you if if all you are is perfect and you've never screwed up? Like if you, if you say you've never screwed up or had a mistake, you're full of shit because everybody has and everybody knows it. And, and like that, that is the first thing for me, just because I mean, I wrote the book. So um, when somebody goes, oh, we've never had an upset customer. I, I, I tune that conversation out. I'm done with that conversation. I just know it's not true. It's like, well, maybe you don't know that you have what you have or you're totally lying, but you don't give yourself the space to let that feedback come in. Because what's interesting is when you set the expectation with a client, hey, I might screw something up. And if I do, I'll make it right. But, but I'm giving you the space and the permission to tell me about it. We can talk about it. Some companies, they're so polished, the customer doesn't even feel like they can tell them because the company doesn't, they literally don't speak the language. It's like a foreign language to them. Mm. It's very interesting, isn't it? The, the communication between business and customer and having, having that right level and letting the customer know that they can come to you if, you, if they have a problem. How do you deal yeah. with, problems if you if you happen upon customers that are not so pleased how do you turn those around you know i have i have a i have a process i outlined it in the book but when some when somebody comes to you with a concern mm -hmm. whatever your opinion or perspective on it is it's their concern they, they have a valid concern now i do talk about the 
the the people that will never be happy, right? The Karens or the Kens or whatever whatever they're called. But like, there's people that you're never going to make happy, and and maybe that's the case. But 98, 99 percent of the time, there's a concern. So hear them out, and then understand the importance of that concern and address it. And I think where people get relieved is like when I bring a concern to somebody and they say, Matt, you're right. I screwed that up. I'm so relieved because just the admission that it's there, that's step one. So step one is admit what's going on, evaluate. So, you know, painting a baby, hey, is baby okay? This was a big, mm -hmm. a big mistake. Mm -hmm. Maybe we spill some paint in the grass. That, that's a little bit different from a severity level, but you address the severity level and then you approach it and you find a solution. You communicate the solution to, to the person. And then there's this constant, it's a sales process, right? You're getting continued buy-in. Hey, is this, is this a good solution? Are you good? I just want to make sure that when, when this mistake is, we're on the other side of it, I dropped the ball, you know, we picked it up, we hit a home run mm -hmm. and that's, and that's what you want. And people will, people will write you better reviews and refer you more if there is something in the experience. Like, think about that. Think about somebody that's screwed something up and then really made it right for you. You're 10 times more likely to refer them than somebody that Just maybe never it. screwed up or screwed up and then never did anything about it. Yeah. And yeah, part of the reason I wanted to explore that is because some people, they're concerned about giving feedback and they're also concerned about getting it. And that's mm -hmm. what holds yeah. a lot of people back is yeah. sure, that fear of judgment, but that fear of feedback. But if you don't get feedback, how do you know where and how to improve? And what's interesting is for me, so I'm in two different kinds of businesses. If we paint a house and somebody's upset with the paint, that's the physical paint on the on the wall on the house. When it's me or you, we're throwing a retreat and you put your life and your soul in, into this, right? Like, you know, you're up, up, up late, up early, putting this thing together. They're like, I didn't like this. We take that so personally it, with, a, with a brand, a personal brand. There's there's not a coat of paint in between the owner and the receiver. So you can talk shit, you can talk about the paint all you want. We'll fix it. It's paint, but I, like I personally will feel, oh man, they don't, they don't like me mm -hmm. or, you know, something that I did. So we, we can't take things personally, you know, e even in the personal brand space, you're, you're providing a product to service, something that's setting an expectation and it didn't get met for whatever reason. And, and yeah, you have to be open to that because the, a, a customer that screams loudly, whether they're happy or not, is better than one that doesn't say anything. It's the ones that don't say anything that you have to be careful about. Oh, that's a very good point. And yeah. also, like, try not to take things personally. And sometimes people people are just complainers and they moan and they, they've got a victim yeah. mentality. And yeah. recognising oh, yeah. the difference of that's a you problem mm -hmm. and not something I did takes a lot of yeah. work and, and some emotional intelligence to work out the difference. It, it does. Mm -hmm. And and I always, you know, I tell people business is a two way street. Uh, the customer's not always right. So somebody approaches you as a business owner and they don't like your paint job or they don't like whatever you're doing. And then they start attacking you personally, like they're making it personal. You have every right as a business owner to say, hey, whatever the business issue is, we'll correct that. You're not going to talk. We're not we're not going to come over here because if we come over here, it's going to be a different discussion. So you can you can stop that. And I've fired customers where it's like, hey, you didn't like the the line on your wall back here on this blue wall and now you're talking shit about my family or me as a man like okay yeah, let's, let's get back to the paint or or, yeah. we'll, or we'll just cut it off so yeah there's um i think how people give feedback and us as entrepreneurs right we're, we got to give feedback to somebody else we have to think about how we provide that to somebody and um but the world yeah the world there, there's people there's five percent of people i think in the world that you'll just never make happy no matter what the more you can find them on the front end and then don't invite them to the mastermind. I won't invite them. To... One, one guy really wanted to go to Spain. I'm like, mm -mm. you're not coming to Spain. No, just I killed the conversation, you know. It's funny, isn't it? It takes a little while to work out what these people are like um, from the off. Like yeah. we're application only because it's very important to have the right people in the room. And like, yeah. I now know who will be right and who won't. And I, I mean, I'm sure I'll still make a mistake down the line. But so yeah. far, like on the new mastermind, on the new retreat, I'm really pleased with the the community that's been built and being able to go, no, actually, you're not a right fit. Yeah. 
it's really empowering. Well, and you're serving and you're serving your customers. You know, you're serving the people that it is a, a right fit for. My my wife and I, we do a, a couples night where we bring couples in and uh, we evaluate their leadership language. So it's disc and personality profiling surveys, yeah. and we just talk as, as married couples about communication and leadership and everything. And yeah, there was one event where it just it went off the rails with somebody, and I saw everybody else there, and I didn't know because it's we just didn't vet that person, and kind of went off the rails a little bit. So we just do we just do a little <laughs> bit, little bit little more, a little bit more, a little bit more vetting. Yeah. Well, and, and it makes me think back to the beginning days of business. And I, and I remember this, I would come home to Emily, we're first couple of years of business. And, you know, I land a job and I, and Emily's helping with the back end bookkeeping and phone answering. She goes, Oh, you, you landed a job with this person. I go, yeah, well, this person, same person called was kind of a, kind of an ass. I go, yeah, but we need the business. So there's that. I need to eat shit for a few years mentality. I think how do I put it? So as a, as a business owner, like you got to work, you got to grind, you got to, you got to really put in the work, but I'd be really careful about, don't feel like you have to take somebody on that's going to treat you poorly, treat your people poorly, or that they're never going to be happy just because you need to, you need to make the money. Right. I think I, I, for a long time was scared of telling people no, and we would take on clients that we knew we should, and they were never happy. And it ended up going South. And then when I finally just said, no, I mean, I remember the first time I fired a customer and the team was like, awesome. Thank you for making life better. I first was scared about the $7,000 job we lost, yeah. but then the team turned around and they're like, we were so much more happy that next week. They found five times more opportunities. So just, just be careful about that. I know we kind of sidelined into that, Yeah. but that made me think back to those early days. You don't need to eat shit so much. Yeah, I would totally agree. And I, I don't think we realise that at the time so often. So it's a good thing to talk about, to remind people of. If they are just starting up or looking to scale up, you might, yeah. you know, when you're just, just chasing the money, things often don't work out. Like coming from a better place of looking after your people, coming from a place of service, doing it for the right reasons, you're going to get better results than the people that come and join you anyway. Absolutely. Yep. One hundred percent. So we we teach health, wealth, and happiness. I call it the triangle of life, and it's mm -hmm. about finding yourself rather than getting lost in the Bermuda Triangle. And and it, it's about looking after your mental, physical, spiritual health, and ensuring that you're building your business in the right way and doing things that you enjoy because life's yeah. too short to be miserable. How do you? Yeah. Or do you maintain a balance of life? You have a lot of stuff going on. You have many mm -hmm. things running. Do you yeah. have a triangle of life? You know, I, I think balance is a myth. I think people throw that word out there and it's very idealistic. It sounds good on paper. So the reality of it right now, to, today, today, Wednesday, yeah. I left the house early. I'll typically drive my kids to school. Like today, I didn't. And they knew that. I have back to back to back to back podcasts. I have like half a lunch right over here. I didn't, I didn't finish the lunch. No, it's true. Um, and that's how the next couple of weeks are going to be because three weeks from today, I'm going to be gone for 18 days with my daughter, Haley in Spain, and it's going to be all about her. So this whole idea of this perfect balance, there's always going to be something out of balance. And I think balance and, and health of that balance are, are different things. I think being intentional about, you know, what are the goals? What are the outcomes I want in these different domains of my life? How am I going to get them? And I think every entrepreneur needs to have absolute control over their schedule and what they're doing within that schedule. You can't control time. You can control where your attention goes within that time. Everybody has the same hours. So I, you know, I time block and color code everything very specifically. I put family first. Mm -hmm. And then if there's going to be a, a season where I'm getting home a little later, you know, I have, I have breakfast with the family just about every day, dinner with the family every day. Uh, but it might be a long day in between that. And I might work weekends, but they know that they're okay with that. And they know it's only for a certain amount of time. And um, I think that whole, you know, what's what's a business worth that, that you've built where you've made millions of dollars and your family isn't happy with you when you get home or they're not there because they want to hang around and wait for you to come home and they just leave. Yeah. And it's that communication again, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah communication structure clarity and schedule and then just just checking in i mean and there's times emily emily goes hey you're a little busy right now are you sure i have a million ideas before breakfast 
she's like, we're going to park, we're going to park that idea right now. Great idea. But it's, it, you know, so, so keeping that in mind, we don't need to do everything at once or feel like we have to do everything at once. You can't be everything to everybody all the time. You know, you can't. And that's a really good point that sometimes some things are going to take priority over something else. And that's okay. Yeah. As long as you know that you're going to pull it back a bit later down the line. So having this yeah. period of a few weeks where you're doing all of this and then knowing you're going away with your daughter to Spain, it, yeah. it, it you know, it works for you and you've created that life that, that works for you. So tell us a bit more about what you're going to be doing in Spain. So ever since the kids were, were little, I mean, as young as they could travel, uh, four, five years old, I take my son to Spain one year and then my daughter another year. So we have our, our cities that we like to hit. So I studied in Alcalá de Henares. So we're going to hang out there for a few days. This trip, we're going to drive out to uh, Nazare. I don't know if you've been there in Portugal. Oh. They've got the big waves, those huge, huge waves. And it's not the high wave season, uh, but we just want to check out Portugal. And we're going to drive down the coast and spend about 10, 11 days in uh, Huelva, which we love. There's a little resort we love there. Uh, and then we're going to go to the Feria de Sevilla. So Sevilla is my favorite city ever, ever. And they have their their annual fair. They literally shut the town down for a week and they just dance and party. And she's got her beautiful flamenco dress and I'm going to get all dressed up. It's the only time I wear a tie. And um, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to go hang out. And then we've got some really good friends and just great relationships over there. So just get to unplug and hang out and have just good good time with her. She's 12. So she's at a very interesting like transitional point of life right now where she just needs dad a lot. So I've got some fun things planned to um, just make sure that she's doing good and you know she knows daddy loves her. Good, I love that. I'm really close with my dad. Um, we went to the mainland Spain a lot. I yep. first came abroad to Mallorca when I was 11 and I didn't mm -hmm. realize that this was the first place I came to abroad until the second year that I lived here. <laughs> right. And we went to Alcudia. And um, like me and my dad, we do loads of stuff together. Like I said, he was over here for two weeks and we usually go to Vegas every year and mm -hmm. we just, we just laugh. So it's really nice to see that you're having that kind of relationship with your daughter as well. And, you know, she's going to really appreciate that later on in life. Like I hope like I do. Yeah, no, it's um she she already she already talks about it. You know, we uh I I, I don't go I, most of the concerts I've been to are Spanish speaking concerts. So you you know who David Bisbal is if you live in Spain. So lo love his music. He came to Texas last year, so we drove down there for her birthday and um he sang to her. We were like like right there in the front row and he was talking to her, singing to her. She had a little sign that it was her birthday and she's just like, I'll remember that forever. Yeah. It was, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. So, you know, and, that, and that's another, another point, like we, for, for people that are doing business, making money, having success, uh, there's so much on social media about, oh, invest this and wealth's important, right? Like, but how much do you want to park away and not touch or like, go have an experience. You know, I, you couldn't trade, you couldn't trade the smile on that girl's face at that concert for any amount of money ever. No. You know, so I think I get hard on myself now. I'm like, oh, I didn't buy enough real estate. I didn't do enough this. I'm not leaving enough X number of whatever. And I think everybody thinks like that, whether they say it or not. I'm not doing enough. It's like, well, what what have you done that you that you're not measuring that that was way more impactful than than anything like that? So that's always a good good perspective to have. Yeah, those memories, those experiences that you hold on to, that. Like, I, I never want to get to the end of my life and think I wish I'd done this or I wish I'd been there and yes yeah. you know life's too short for that you have to create the memories and do, do the things so that you live on when you're not here as well because yes. there will be a yeah. time that we're not and people won't necessarily remember like it's that saying I don't I don't remember who said this but they don't necessarily remember what you said but they remember the way that they you made them feel and absolutely yeah that's a massive part of building other people's confidence as well. So I believe that like in, in my mastermind, we don't just talk about business. We talk through their health and happiness as well, but I give them other opportunities to create memories. Like we went paintballing recently and awesome. yeah. yeah. So we're doing other things. There'll be other things throughout the year. That's like team building and leadership and like learning things in like a hands-on way. 
that it's not just mm -hmm. the yeah. table because that it has its pla it has its place, but those experiences that make things different. So like when you take people to to Spain on on your next retreat, those people are going to go yeah. and have this incredible time. What do they then do to implement what they learn in their business to build their business? Yeah, so when we took the team last year, so we did something a little different. It's different. I have two different experiences. The Camino is a unplug, disconnect, recenter, refocus, and then relax, rest, and rejuvenate. So it's more of just an unplug, reevaluate your life, and then come back refocused. So they'll have a tangible workbook of how they did that. When we did the other experience, Ultimate Immersion, that is, think of like a combination of once-in-a-lifetime experiences, tours, a, a combined with an amazing race style. So literally, here's a clue in an envelope. You have 10 euros and you need to go do these things in a city, in a place where you don't know the people, you don't know the language. And I'll see you in an hour. Whoever checks the most boxes on this clue wins. And then I just go sit and have a coffee <laughs> and just watch them and then watch them have fun and struggle and everything and go through all the emotions. And and again, like nobody's going to die. They're safe. They're going to be really uncomfortable. So they they get back. And it, it tests their comfort zone. So they come back to business. And one of the gentlemen here that works with us, he came to me the other day and he's like, Matt, I've got, I've got a big issue here. Don't know what to do about it. It's really uncomfortable. I'm like, okay, so what are you like, what are you going to do? You've been here before. Like, I've never been in something like this before. I'm like, you haven't had this business experience, but you were in a really uncomfortable situation where you used the resources you had. So you, you, show that to them in a very experiential way. And then I have to remember as the leader, I can't just say, Oh, remember Spain. It's like, no, you, you were here. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. And, and then, and then they go for it. And, and we debriefed at the end of every day, we had these little passport books that we created and we stamped, there were 16 different character qualities or values or things that we were looking for. So bravery, vulnerability, things like that. So we would just sit around the table and they were able to see that they have the characteristics of a great leader through how they not reacted, but how they responded to these yeah. experiences. Yeah. I love that. That sounds, yeah. I can't, I don't want to give too much away. I remember when this is coming out, this before or after the retreat. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, a lot of it's on the website. I don't, and no, I'll never no, share like, like, um, like, I don't, yeah. I don't share everything that we do. <laughs> but no, like, I love that because we're, we're, we're doing something similar to that on, on our retreat as well, like getting people to think outside the box, putting them in yeah. that kind of uncomfortable, how do I solve this problem? And um, right, when mm -hmm. I was a kid, my dad used to do me treasure treasure maps, treasure hunts around the house. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's, a, there's a clue. And then I've got to solve it. And just like, and it would be so it might be in the, the video box and then it might be in the oven. Mm -hmm. Like all of these different things to get you thinking in a different way, like problem solving. And like, we don't do enough stuff like this as adults. Yeah. And we get stuck in ruts, you know? So, so part of the experience is you're going, you're going to a new environment, just, just changing your physical environment. I mean, everything, the sounds, the, the, the language, everything, the food, it, it just, it puts your body in a different state and place to receive, receive those lessons. We'll have to compare. We'll totally have to compare notes after the podcast and, um, I've got some fun ideas because I want to hear more about what you're doing. You know, the the top secret planning that we can't tell people about. <laughs> I'll tell right everyone, now. yeah. <laughs> you just got to, you got to go on the retreat. Got to go on your retreat. To find exactly. out. Exactly. That's how you find out. Right. It's the same. People mm -hmm. need to go on yours. People need to come on mine and maybe go on both and like learn so much. <laughs> yeah. I love it. No, I love it. Yeah. So what's the best thing that you feel like you provide um, in your life? What gives you the most joy? What gives me the most joy? Yeah. Is be, being a beacon of hope for people and a positive example for people, right? Whether that's in business with, with family, anybody, anybody that I, that I come across that, that makes me really happy. And that's a, that's my purpose. My, my purpose is to inspire and ignite others to understand that they have a story, like they're writing a book. And they can write the book that they want. And, and it needs to be an excellent one because you literally get one one shot and that's it. Yeah. I was going to say, we do have yeah. one life and what we choose to do with it is very important. And yeah. I always, well, I believe that just owning up to mistakes and giving yourself permission to learn from them and be better from the last time, it's going to make you do so much more and 
enjoy your life more as well yeah. you know just being open to making those mistakes and to failing because otherwise without yeah. trying you're never going to know what could happen yeah i heard a really great quote that a successful person a winner sits on a mountain of their failures and celebrates and then you have the same same pile of failure and people that are victims or defeated or complaining or whining, they just lay underneath and, oh, it's so heavy. And look look at everything that happened to me. It's the mm-hmm. same stuff. Everybody's had failure. And um, you, you learn from it. And it's like every time you have one, it builds this bigger mountain that either crushes you. It's like, where are you? Are you under the rock or on top of the rock? Same rock. And uh, people, people forget about that. I think that's really powerful and a really nice way to bring this to a close. Um, to yeah. leave people with that to, to go and sit on top of your own mountain and if you could give people one tip to increase their confidence what would it be is believe in believe in yourself you can do you can do anything you want and I just I should be dead or in prison I mean I literally my story everybody's dead or in prison how did I get here you believe in yourself you work hard you set goals you keep after it and, and just be really conscious of, of who you let into your life and who you let speak into your life and, and keep an eye on that those two voices of yours that you've got amazing thank you where can people follow you find you online stalk you because as i always say we're a fan of online Stalking. stalking but not in person so. cool <laughs> no no in person please no no um so everything uh, if you go to mattshop.com like i said at the beginning of the show i've got a set of free tools you can download and then from there all of the resources, the trips, the travel, and then I've got all my social icons so you can stalk me. I do a, I do a morning coffee video every weekday. It's less than a minute, it's a real, just, just a life business leadership tip. Those all feed into the website, so go check those out. Awesome, thank you. Um, but everything will go in the show notes anyway. Um, but thank you very much for being an amazing guest. I've, I think you've got an incredible story that the listeners will take inspiration from and to everybody listening go and do something whatever it is today go and do something that gives you joy face your fears and live in confidence because life's too short to be miserable so thank you very much for being here matt thank you to everybody who's listening downloading and subscribing make sure you share it with your friends family colleagues loved ones and always the people that you don't like because everybody needs help <laughs> so thank you very much and we'll see you on the next thank one you.